welcome to Tell Me About East Asia, a podcast presented by the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Arizona. This episode is the second part of the local portion of China Town Hall 2024. from David Peets, another China expert here. Um, we uh, And that's a question that I think a lot of us share, at least I share that question too. What do you think it will take to get students in the U.S. to get interested in studying China and Chinese again? Oh, wow. That's a great question, David. Mm-hmm. Uh, and an important question. Uh, because I, I've seen this in my 45 years. You know, I was in the first group of American scholars that went to China in 1979. And, 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 and at the time, I was as interesting. It's a funny story. It, it was a big deal, um, and, and I was on. I was interviewed on the radio. In, in you know, I was at Stanford now, and I was interviewed on the radio at, at uh, in the Bay Area, and it was actually a Chinese American interviewer. And and we were talking about my being in the first group and being chosen by Stanford to go. And she, and she asked me a question that really threw me for a loop at the time. She says, "Are you afraid?" I said, afraid of what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> she said, no, are you afraid to go to China? I mean, are, are you afraid? And I, I really threw me for a loop. I, didn't, I, I had that think about it, thinking, well, maybe she knows something I don't know, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't want to immediately answer, think, oh, okay, what does she know that I don't know? And then I really, no, I don't think, you know, no, I, I'm not afraid. In fact, you know, I, I think her group really represents a new turn in you know, in U.S.-China relations, my guess is we're probably going to be taken pretty good care of, <laughs> given how symbolic we were. And in fact, I, I, it turned out to be true. We it, it took great care of us. But, you know, beginning of that time, there was sort of this, this fear of China or you know, going to China. And of course, through the years, it's been different at, at, at different times. And so uh, the sentiment about going to China to study and, and do things has waxed and waned. And as we heard today, and as we all know, it's it's it's, it's waned a great deal for lots of reasons. But it's and and one of those reasons is, is I think the difficulty in the relationship, uh, the 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 mistrust, the suspicion, and quite frankly, I think a heightened sense of danger um, of of going to China. And is this, you know, is this really something I want to do compared to other things I need to get done in my life? And and, and so whereas you know, students I taught over the decades, they felt like, you know, China was something they needed to understand, no matter what they did in their life going forward, business or academia, they needed to develop a good understanding of China. Now, I think people still think that way, but I think they're thinking, well, maybe I don't have to go to China to do that. I can maybe check that box in some other way or put it off or or whatever. But these are particularly, these are exactly the times when we need people Mm -hmm. uh, to be studying Chinese, learning about Chinese. It's, it's when the relationship is difficult that we need to rely on people who really understand uh, the, the two sides and can speak and stand up and speak on behalf of both sides and, and, and be that bridge. So it, great, it concerns me greatly that the number of students have, have gone down. And, and I think we as educators and, and mentors, you know, we have a responsibility for doing that. But as as Kurt said, you know, there's there are things that are outside of our control, like State Department travel protocols, uh, like uh, people getting you know, arrested in China, not not being allowed to leave, uh, concerns about academic freedom, uh, things like that, and and those are outside our control, and and they naturally have an impact on on how people think about you know uh, spending time in China. Well, I do see a question from the audience, but let me ask a follow-up question because you mentioned, because again, this question is just very important for us oh, yeah. both as a center and as a department. Um, so you said that perhaps people think, you know, people have these concerns, safety or otherwise, right, about China. And therefore, maybe that that's why they're not learning Chinese or, or about China. But then let's look at the history, right? When during the, the Cold War era, um, that was when the interest in learning Russian 
reached its peak historically, right? right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is it not happening to to Chinese in China? Oh, uh, well, I guess I'll turn the question around on you. You're the expert. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think you did your you did your PhD work on 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 uh, on students exchanges and stuff, didn't it? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, I hate to put you on the hot spot, but I, I'd love to hear your view, quite frankly, and I'll, I'll respond to that. Yeah, it's I mean, it's clearly baffling to me. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that the interest in studying abroad in Russia or the then Soviet Union was reaching its peak during the Cold War era. That was not the case. But the interest in, you know, at least we see, you know, enrollments in Russian language classes, Russian co uh, cultural classes and Russian departments overall, we see a lot of growth during that era. Um, I don't know. I think that there is, perhaps we're seeing some kind of shift that we are shifting from uh, one era when we have, at all these students who are interested in learning Chinese or, or China because of business or economics, right? Um, and those students naturally wouldn't necessarily be interested in national security <laughs> and learning Chinese for national security. Whereas, you know, for, for Russian, I don't think there was a time before that. Um, and perhaps also, like you said, that... Um, there wasn't, um, you know, for Russia, there was also uh, perhaps the, the 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 liberal wing politics in the U.S. I wasn't here. That's, I wasn't born. <laughs> and so I don't know if I'm saying this uh, uh, accurately. But at least I think that there was also the, the liberal wing in the U.S. that was actually somewhat supportive of the Soviet Union ideology, which, I, which like you were saying, this is on China, this is where the two parties in the U.S. actually unite, right? They have a lot of, they, they, they share a lot of commonalities rather than having different opinions. So I don't know, maybe maybe that that's that too. We do see, um, you know, I was just at a conference over the weekend, uh, the past weekend. We do also hear that um, this is not very public yet, but I don't mind sharing it. We actually heard that the Congress is actually cutting a lot of support for national security related language initiatives, um, we're seeing um, reductions, not increases in um, in programs that uh, federally fund learning yeah. the learning of Chinese um, at the college level or the K through 16, K through 12 level, um, which was not happening during the Cold War era. So I think that there's the, the shifting interest, um, the changing, bipartisan politics um and also the lack of congressional federal right. support well, those well, are well, my theories i mean that that's just a couple of quick points that we need to reinstall the fulbright's program I mean, that just absolutely has to be restarted and refunded absolutely uh, i myself was the beneficiary of four years of what at the time was called a uh, um, National Defense Foreign Language Fellowship, which was a government fellowship to to yeah. study Chinese back in, when I was in college. I was a, I went to China on that essentially paid for me to me in China. Uh, so yeah, I I, I I I agree that this is very important. But as you heard Kirk Campbell saying in his in his response to Steve Orleans, the State Department is recruiting, is trying to get Chinese speakers. Yes. So there are opportunities there. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Hopefully our students can hear that too. Yeah. Rich. Uh, Worth, 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 Wertheimer, yeah. another person. Okay. With I'm sorry. Yeah, no, Richard spent a, uh, his 40 years in, in Asia as an investment banker, mostly on the buy side, and has mm. incredible expertise on looking at China, primarily, you know, from a financial investor point of view. Hey, Rich, how you doing? Hey, hey, Frank, how's it going? All right. Um, Aloha. So actually, I was going to, I was going to ask actually the question about, uh, about the, the lack of, um, exchanges and interactions and you know the, the interest levels as well somebody else mm -hmm. asked that question so i was just um because it is it's obviously a, it's a concern particularly for somebody who's a product of that mm -hmm. of that you know of that process you know back when we were in china um and i was just you know to, to sort of my sense is when we went and the reason why there was i think interest is, the, is that china was opening up and it, it senses now it's kind of going it's like ping pong diplomacy in reverse mm -hmm. and so i think that you know and you see this on a, on a very grassroots as well as institutional level so i thought i'd just throw you two softball questions um one is how does the situation with taiwan get resolved how do you see that getting resolved 
Oh, well, and, what's the next one? So I hope it's even easier. <laughs> this, yeah, this, uh, uh, just picking up on the on the growth versus security issue. How does that how, how does that end? It, it, sort of the like, same same idea. What's you know something has to give, and how does that sort of play out? Yeah, yeah. Easy two really. Things. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Really. Yeah, I'm here for you. I, I now regret sending you the notice for this session. <laughs> um, Taiwan, Taiwan, meh, Taiwan. Um, you know, I think next to the Middle East, this is the toughest one in, on the globe right now, uh, how it gets resolved. Um, now, having said that, and having been around China long enough, um, we outsiders... <laughs> can come up with a thousand scenarios about how the Taiwan, the mainland Taiwan situation can get resolved. And the Chinese and the mainlanders and the Taiwanese are, are going to come up with a thousand and first yes. that we didn't think of, right? To either reduce tensions or to resolve it completely. So uh, the question is, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, all, all we, I think the United States can do, is do everything in its power to ensure that both sides of the strait are thinking in constructive ways on how to do this, not in destructive ways of how to do this. Um, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of ink spilled in the press about you know, what would happen in a mainland Taiwanese conflict, who would win, who would lose. And one how we've had this conversation. You know, I, I think you, one has to put yourself in the Xi Jinping's position of even if the mainland were to win such a military conflict, the real problem starts the day after they win. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, what are we going to do with this place? We're going to have 20 some million disgruntled people, perhaps a guerrilla warfare that we have to deal with. They're not going to get TSMC. It will be destroyed. All the human capital will be gone. Um and and the world will now be, you know, if, if if you thought sanctions up till now were difficult, wait till you know China attacks Taiwan. What kind of global economic environment will will that be for for, for China? Again, at twenty five percent of U.S. GDP per capita, right? So for all those reasons, I, I think it's highly unlikely that that the mainland would launch. Uh, you know, a frontal attack. Now, there, like I said, there's a thousand different ways this could happen that aren't so frontal or confrontational. Uh, I've always said that, you know, China could take Taiwan essentially with a press conference, you know, simply by saying, oh, by the way, Taiwan airspace is now Chinese airspace. If you want to fly a commercial airline into Taipei, you got to get our permission. Uh, you know, just what would that do to the, to the Taiwanese economy, right? Uh, just saying things like that, it, you know, really exerting China's views on on Taiwan status, not just saying it, but starting to exert those views in nonviolent ways. Um, so, you know, like I said, there's a thousand ways this could play out and, 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 and they'll figure out the thousand and first. Um, but it gets to your second question. And I don't remember the, exactly what the question was, but you know, how, how China's economic problems play out, there are two possible, well, two main roads, I think. One is that we kind of see if China's sort of moderating at least its, its, um, its speech uh, on U.S.-China relations and foreign policy uh, overall. Uh, being more moderating, uh, I think they've seen that their economic problems you know, are approaching insurmountability, going back to the dungest sort of phase where, well, we need the international, we need the international system to help us here, right? We can't do this on our own. And I, so I think we do see a certain moderating of that uh, in speech. The question is, as Kurt Campbell mentioned and Steve Orleans mentioned, are we going to see it in reality? That's sort of one road, which is the welcome road. Uh, the other road, which would be less welcome, is if we see crisis in China as a result of various things happening, including the economy, and 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 the leadership in China feels the need to lash out and to scapegoat uh, external players. 
and, and, and to create crises in order to, you know, this is the classic, this is the classic playbook. Um, that's another possible road, which we, none of us want to see and, and we need to work to avoid, but that I, I, you know, I can't say that's not impossible. Um, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, it did. Thank you. Thank you for those very difficult questions. Um, do we have any oh. more? Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I feel like whoever can answer how to yeah, resolve should, the Taiwan yeah, issue. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to Rich one day. You, you, <laughs> you'll, you'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Or do we have any comments, thoughts? Yeah, tell me I'm crazy. Come on, let's talk about it. <laughs> I would like to just add a little bit more because, you know, we are University of Arizona and um, we are in a fairly strategic and uh, how should I, for lack of a better word, let's just say strategic position uh, in the in the sort of China, Taiwan, U.S. triangle. Um, so uh, as Frank has mentioned several times, um, uh, the Tai Chi Dian, right? The Tia. I always know the Chinese word, and, and I have to think about the English word. The Tia, uh, TSMC, right? The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing oh, mm -hmm, Corporation, mm -hmm. is building its actually third factory uh, right now in Arizona, uh, and so um, so the we. Um, it's for those of you who are in Arizona. This is this is a a a a love triangle that we feel here, and that's also why we think it's really really important in this state uh, to really know and learn more about uh, China and Taiwan and also the U.S. Although I'm sure I'm preaching to the core. If you are here in this webinar, you're invested in this relationship already. You're already you know wanting to know more about the China-U.S. relationship and how to increase the interest in learning about China. How do we get the word out? We yeah. welcome your suggestions here. <laughs> well, actually, your, your comments will actually point to, I think, an issue uh, that the United States is grappling with in its dealings with China. And that's the debate over to the extent to which the U.S. should be in, in, in you know, uh, indulging in, I say indulging in, or pr pursuing uh, industrial policy uh, mm -hmm. in our own economy. Uh, you know, the United States traditionally is an open market economy. And, and some people think that the Chinese have taken advantage of us in that regard. And Kurt Campbell mentioned that, you know, the Chinese complaining about, you know, the U.S. government perhaps, maybe, right, putting restrictions on TikTok, while Google and Facebook and all of the all of the, uh, the social media platforms in the United States are absolutely banned in China. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, I think there's a rising tide in the United States of people saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're, you know free trade is great as long as everybody plays by the same rules. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if a major player doesn't, then we, we kind of have to protect ourselves. And so there's a growing rise of sentiment for the U.S. to, act, to also uh, pursue industrial policy, and Kirk Campbell referred to that in terms of chips, and we see it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and I, as a you know, kind of a a, a free uh, a free market absolutist, right? I just I hate I, I hate this in principle, but you know the reality is is impinging on my beliefs that maybe in some ways, not always, and I think we need to do it maybe in a limited fashion, without giving up our essence, you know, changing our own essence, which is our strength. Perhaps we need to pursue some of that as well. And I think TSMC in Phoenix is, or wherever it is, some up on the Black Canyon Highway somewhere, is an example of what's essentially a political project. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think all sides of the triangle are grappling with how can we make this work economically and commercially within the con overall context of a political project. And I, I think that I think they're, they're grappling with that. And these are some pretty intractable problems they're dealing with. Yeah, and I think that there's definitely space for us um, here at the U of A um, to really. I think it's a it's a responsibility for us at least to to get people more aware of of the complexities mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that they need the knowledge um, to to be able to handle all of this. But let mm -hmm. me. I sometimes you know I wonder if Arizona is really ready for all of this. <laughs> um, you know, um, so yeah, do we? Um, 
you know, Frank, you and I can talk forever, but I just wanted to make sure that we are we are getting the questions from the audience. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience that I have missed or that you are thinking about? Um, can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, Frank talked about the population. So I'm thinking that uh, West is only... 12% of world's population and 88% uh, of world's population are known West. So if the known West uh, would tolerate China to be number one, so why the West wouldn't be able to uh, uh, tolerate China's rise? And also, China's rise might be unstoppable. It's already very strong. So if you want to uh, prevent China from having the highest or the most advanced chips, that probably wouldn't be successful. So that, that's what I think. Maybe China's rise is unstoppable. I don't uh... know whether you agree or not. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, th I think there are a couple parts to your, your your comments, which are great comments, by the way. Uh, and I just want to just kind of go back to what I said in my opening comments is we can't stop China's rise. <laughs> it's it's a fool's errand to think we can, um, generally speaking. Um, China should rise. Uh, there are 1.3 billion people in, in China who deserve to rise and who, who deserve a uh, a greater material existence and more personal liberty. Uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, China should rise, and we should facilitate that to the extent it doesn't undermine our own interests. Um, and and, and uh, so, as I said in my comments, you know, we shouldn't be in the business of containing China or preventing China from rising. Rather, we should be trying to channel it in ways that are we believe are good for the global the global economy and the global world uh, and that are constructive. So I, I agree with you. China's going to rise whether we think it will or not. Um, now your comment specifically about chips, I think is a little more, is a little more complex because I tend to agree with you. I think the answer to staying ahead in technology is staying ahead in technology, <laughs> not, not in preventing your competitors, you know, keeping them down, but maintaining your lead mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's true in general I, I think the last five years have maybe driven that home uh, to to the United States and and so I think there's being you know more concern about staying ahead as opposed to keeping others down but uh, I, I think there's also some merit to in the short term you know maintaining your advantage to the extent you can uh, while you are focusing on on staying ahead, you can do both at the same time. Uh, one doesn't exclude the other. Thank you. Yeah, Paul. Another thing, another thing is that probably there won't be a war between Taiwan and China because tomorrow Xi Jinping and Ma Yingjiu, the past yeah. president of uh, Taiwan <laughs> Republic China, will meet tomorrow. We'll have the, this. Uh, rare meeting you know yeah so, well i hope there's no law i hope there's no war soon because a week from today i'm flying to taipei so <laughs> <laughs> and then and then three weeks after that i'm flying to beijing so you know guys let's keep things cool at least for a while <laughs> <laughs> let's keep the love triangle yeah, love you. triangle yeah, yeah. Exactly. thank you for the wonderful talk oh thank you thank you very much thanks for participating yeah, thank you, Bao Shi. Bao Shi is a professor emeritus here in the department as well and a historian. Um, oh, Hiroshi. <laughs> okay, um, I'm trying to be conscious of time, and um, I think we're actually gonna end uh, about now. Thank you very much for all of uh, your attendance, um, and thank you very much, Frank, uh, for this wonderful discussion. I think all of us have learned. Um, 
quite a bit. Um, and uh, let's keep doing what we're doing and have, hopefully we'll help with, you know, the people to people uh, diplomacy between China and the US. Thank you again and have a good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit our website, ceas.arizona.edu.